I would like to start by thanking the succession for staging this critical lecture series and for launching it with this timely analysis of the Hungarian cultural sector. As Antonia said, my name is Jade Nikolai. I'm a curator and director of an independent arts organization called Blood Mountain Projects. We began in Budapest in 2010 with a remit to explore the cultural past, present and potential of Central Europe and we continue our work in Vienna since 2015. It is a great privilege for me to be here today to present three outstanding viewpoints on the state of Hungarian culture. Our conversation begins in April 2010, when the Fidesz political party claimed an overwhelming two-third victory of the, of the national Hungarian electorate. What follows since is a fundamental restructuring of society where art and activism <coughs> conflate rapidly and regularly in an effort to overthrow nationalistic ideologies, the cult of a political leader, and the falsification of history. Our three exceptional speakers will explain this topic in greater detail. Our first speaker, Sabolcs Kispál in the middle, who is an artist, activist, and educator, will tell us about the first reactions to this situation, namely, action protests, which are organized by art workers and members of civil society. Our second speaker, Katalin Seke, who is a curator at the Open Society Archives and at Off Budapest Biennale, will tell us more about the power and increasing practice of self-censorship based on the shifting fault lines of party politics. Our final speaker, Katarina Sevich, is an artist and initiator of numerous art spaces. Her contribution is about offering alternative modes of art production, working outside a state infrastructure, which is more and more the only alternative. Regrettably, she cannot be with us today, but has sent an audio statement and will be represented by a long-time collaborator and a member of the Hungarian Civic Society, Zsófi Váradi. So to give you some context, allow me to begin with a short summary of recent events. 2011, MMR, which is the new Hungarian Academy of the Arts, which is formerly a small private association of aging conservative artists, is voted by parliament to become a state institution, gifting it with the same rights and authority as the Academy of Sciences. This marked the start of a new authoritarian grip on power, where museums began to be considered as too cosmopolitan and too independent, and culture became the ground for many ideological battles. January 1, 2012, the new constitution is introduced with a mission, I quote, to protect our culture. August, the National Gallery of Art, based in the Buddha Castle, becomes part of the Museum of Fine Arts, that is located on the other side of the city, and subsequently receives a disproportionate increase in state funding at a cost to other public art institutions. November, the director of the Mucharnok, the Kunsthalle in Budapest, resigns, and it becomes the first institution to belong to the MMR. This brings a new era of resistance and protest by art workers. 2013, January, the director of the Museum of Applied Arts resigns because he opposes the relocation of the Esterhazy collection to an external space called the Fertöd Castle and the reassignment of the museum's East, art, East Asian art collection to the Museum of Fine Arts. At this stage, it becomes the fourth state institution to fall under the directorship of the Museum of Fine Arts, which is led by a marketing expert and party loyal who lacks any formal education in the arts. March. A series of action protests begin, which Subwatch will explain in greater detail. April 2013, the government restructures the electoral rules in preparation for the upcoming election, scheduled exactly 12 months later, and launches a fierce political campaign built on populist ideals, right-wing xenophobia, and conservative Christian rules. As pointed out by the first English language summary of these events, published by Eflux Journal in September 2014, and written by the Hungarian art historian Edith András, three distinct factors begin to define the cultural politics of Hungary. One, sport becomes a priority, which is personified by the new national football stadium that is inaugurated in 2008 and built for 3,816 people in the Prime Minister's hometown of Felcsort which in itself is home to only 1,688 inhabitants. Number two, the appearance of the Sekai flag, 
which represents an ethnic minority group based in Transylvania, begins to appear on many municipal buildings, many of which are subsidized by the EU, but the EU flag remains absent. These become clear political uh, um, demonstrations of a charged effort to reclaim cultural identity and political power that actually rests outside the Hungarian present border. And lastly, third, an overt display of Christianity becomes a guiding principle for all political, social, cultural and moral actions of the ruling Fidesz party. This is actually a very unique situation in a relatively secular post-communist country and mysteriously coexists with shamanism and the cult of pagan Hungarian mythology, including the revival of a mythological bird called the Turol. So, on your chairs, we have a series of glossaries in German and English, which we hope will guide you through today's conversations. There are a few acronyms and terms that you might like to refer to during our speakers. So, without further ado, let me introduce you to our first speaker. Sabolcs Gispal is an artist sitting in the middle, an activist and an educator. He's a docent in the Intermediate Department of the Academy of Fine Arts in Budapest, and he's a founding member of many art and civic groups, including the Free Art Association and The City Belongs to Everyone. Sabolcs has held solo exhibitions recently at the Project Art Space in Dublin, at the Edith Ross House for Media Art in Germany, and at Transit Romania. He has also participated in group shows in the Seoul Biennial and at Apex Art in New York. Born in Maros Vashar-Hey, which is based in North Romania, which during the Habsburg times belonged to the Hungarian monarchy, he began his studies in Cluj and, age 26, relocated to Budapest. Today, he is considered one of the most socially and politically engaged artists, constantly pushing the boundaries of new media, visual culture and civic society. Sabolc. <clears throat> Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jade, for this nice uh, introduction. I will try to, <clears throat> to give you an introduction of uh, maybe 15 minutes into what really happened in the <clears throat> uh, Hungarian culture. And uh, <clears throat> I will go through actually these uh, points. And at the end of my presentation, I'm going to speak a bit uh, about uh, two of my projects. And one of the projects has a uh, publication, so in the meantime, uh, I would just give this to the audience, so you are welcome to... Thank you very much. So you are welcome to flip through it and uh, <clears throat> to have an idea. It's, it is quite an extensive project, so I won't have the time to speak that much about it. And, uh, yeah, so uh, if we try to take a look on what really happened in the Hungarian culture from 2010 on, we got a very <clears throat> kind of... Uh, uh, detailed um, um, kind of uh, timeline of, uh, of, of different events which uh, actually uh, led to, to the actual situation. Um, I will concentrate only on, uh, <clears throat> on the cultural aspects and uh, unfortunately we won't have time to, to go in the, <clears throat> in the details what happened uh, in the, let's say, institutional, legal and economical field which I think uh, uh, it is uh, also at least that consistent what happened in the culture, not speaking about the social uh, <coughs> effects of all the uh, kind of legislative steps the new government took since uh, 2010. So if we concentrate on culture, for sure one of the most important uh, events was the already mentioned uh, the, the establishment of uh, this uh, Hungarian Academy of Arts which you can uh, kind of see a few uh, kind of lines about it, uh, what uh, I consider that are the characteristics of this uh, <clears throat> uh, body, which has been actually put on the top of the Hungarian culture, and uh, <clears throat> uh, since then, actually it controls all the possible uh, sources of, uh, uh, like financial sources of art, but also organizational sources and institutional sources and uh, <clears throat> infrastructure of art. And uh, therefore, if we take a closer look on, on how this academy has, uh, uh, has been built up and what are its characteristics, we might uh, uh, come to the conclusion that actually it is the perfect embodiment of, uh, <clears throat> uh, of this concept, which, uh, uh, yeah, which was promoted uh, in 2014 by uh, um, uh, Viktor Orban, <clears throat> uh, which is called like the illiberal uh, uh, democracy or illiberal state. 
So within the culture, practically, the Hungarian Academy of Arts is the, <clears throat> the embodiment of this particular politics, and you can see on the bottom of the page what would be the, uh, yeah, the, the, the main characteristics of, of this kind of, uh, <clears throat> uh, let's say, um, institutional structure. Uh, and since 2010, uh, this, um, uh, this body, which used to, um, actually, as, as uh, Jade already mentioned, uh, <clears throat> so it, it consisted uh, initially of maybe 20, uh, 20 members, and for sure the whole story of, of how this uh, uh, institution uh, <clears throat> uh, got to the, let's say, height of the Hungarian culture. It started in, uh, uh, around the, <clears throat> the system change uh, uh, of Hungary. Uh, in particular, in, in uh, 1992, when actually the <coughs> um, Hungarian Academy of Sciences was established, and from from that particular body, some people uh, in that particular body, some people weren't uh, invited, and for that reason, they uh, they got very upset. So they established their own kind of academy, which was a symbolic uh, kind of gathering of friends, and they were, you know play to be a counter-academy. This happened in 1992. And then in 2010, when the new government came to power, uh, actually the, the whole turn happened. And since then, uh, you can see on this uh, graph uh, their, let's say, career, uh, probably like the details which you can read there, I, I don't need to comment on. Uh, so by now, they are the most, uh, let's say, uh, influential and important, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, let's say, actor uh, in, the, in the Hungarian cultural scene. And um, even though, like, uh, in, in the very recent times, like in the, in the past few months, uh, <coughs> this idea uh, sort of came out, uh, uh, especially on the, let's say, uh, <coughs> kind of right-wing of the political and cultural um, uh, field, that practically this academy, even though it's been given uh, the amount uh, and power, the amount of money and power you can uh, see on the slide, practically didn't really achieve to practically produce culture. So there is a lot of criticism now going on. And uh, the, uh, yeah, the, the, the actual interpretation why this couldn't happen is that uh, because in spite of the fact that, the, let's say, the takeover was successful, uh, practically, it was not um, uh, it was not successful enough to to get rid of uh, some leading, uh, uh, let's say, leftist liberal uh, thinkers. So what is happening now is that uh, there is a kind of uh, uh, overall um, sort of war raged against uh, these um, uh, few intellectuals who still. Uh, yeah, uh, supposedly uh, hold uh, important positions within the Hungarian culture. Nevertheless, what was the, the reaction of the contemporary art scene? <clears throat> uh, uh, you can see here, like uh, between the, like say, 2012 and 2016. And um, actually, I was introduced here as an activist, which is, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm honored to, to be called like that, but I would say I am a rather a past activist. So within these few years, I've been indeed very much uh, involved in, uh, in various uh, uh, activist uh, groups and activities. And actually, the, <clears throat> the few uh, things you can see unlisted on the slides uh, I had a very uh, close connection to, to all of them, but uh, somehow uh, around 2015 and 16, I kind of stopped uh, this activity. I will come back later on uh, on the reasons why. But before doing that, I would just like to quickly introduce you uh, <clears throat> these few, um, let's say, pseudo institutions which were which were trying to act somehow against uh, the uh, the processes which actually started in 2010, but somehow, um, the, let's say, the, the kind of artistic uh, and cultural scene um, uh, got uh, awareness of, the, of this process and uh, <clears throat> uh, kind of uh, recognized the, the particular uh, depth and danger and radicality of the process only around 2012. And actually, let me just uh, uh, correct here one information uh, provided by, uh, by Jade at the beginning. So the Free Artists Group, for instance, started its activity in 2012. 
not in 2013, actually uh, December 2012, that was the moment when uh, not only the artists and um, the cultural workers, but also, uh, let's say, the students and uh, part of the, uh, of the intellectuals realized that uh, what is going on, it is far more serious than just a simple, you know, turn of uh, uh, power. And uh, so at that time I was, um, um, so together with, with, with many uh, fellow artists uh, <clears throat> and friends, I got very kind of angry and I had a particular range in myself, which actually I shared with, uh, with uh, quite many other people. So one of the things I, I did that I established this, uh, uh, this blog, uh, which uh, in its name refers to the, <clears throat> to the MMA, the, the Hungarian abbreviation of the Hungarian Academy of Arts. And uh, practically the, the logo of, uh, of this blog you can uh, <clears throat> see in the middle. Um, uh, it is um, kind of, it's a kind of appropriation of the uh, former website of this uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, institution. And what I tried to do in this blog, actually you can see uh, described in a, in a few lines uh, above the image. Uh, <clears throat> I, practically I was working uh, alone on this uh, blog, even though I, for short periods of time I had some support from, uh, from some friends. And uh, uh, my, I would say my main intention with, uh, with this blog uh, was to somehow raise awareness uh, uh, on the fact that what is going on in, uh, in Hungary, what I call here on the slides uh, the Hungarian laboratory, I found it very, very significant and important. And uh, for sure at that time, I would say the, uh, the European uh, public opinion didn't really realize that. But I think it's um, um, by now, like all of us, we kind of uh, uh, got to realize that actually the, the, the process which we can uh, experience not only all around Europe, but uh, <clears throat> like recently all around the world, if we think about the United States and the Trumpism and so on. Uh, so the, this process, uh, yeah, we might say that somehow, uh, <clears throat> even if it didn't start really in Hungary, but, but Hungary was maybe the first country in which, uh, because of this very unfortunate uh, kind of uh, legal situation given by the majority of the Fidesz party in 2010, Actually, um, this new kind of ideology, this new nationalism uh, uh, could make his way very swiftly through the whole society and it became a kind of uh, model, I would say, role model for, uh, for many uh, kind of European uh, far-right movements. And uh, just as a kind of footnote, I would add here that I'm very honored to be part of this panel and uh, especially <clears throat> kind of um, uh, if I'm thinking about the further lectures about uh, of this series, but uh, probably it is not by chance that this series, it starts with Hungary. For sure, Hungary is close and for, to Austria and it's kind of, yeah, uh, <clears throat> so one would feel the, uh, <clears throat> yeah, the kind of uh, the cold winds coming from there. But, uh, but also, uh, I think uh, what happened, what started in Hungary in 2010, uh, it's, uh, by now we can realize that it's really, it really has a kind of European uh, um, uh, influence. And uh, that was my intention, actually, for that reason, I was, uh, I was running this blog and I was trying to, to collect and uh, uh, to translate uh, materials in, in, in many European languages and uh, so on. So I was kind of uh, doing this blog until 2016, when I uh, stopped working on it. In the meantime, uh, we established with some uh, <coughs> uh, uh, fellow artists uh, uh, a group which was called uh, Free Artists. It was a kind of spontaneous uh, gathering of uh, university students and teachers and uh, other actors from the <coughs> uh, cultural field. And uh, yeah, so you can uh, kind of uh, uh, read for yourself the, the, the main uh, character of this uh, kind of group. Uh, I think um, our actions were quite uh, kind of successful, even though they demanded a, a, a huge amount of, uh, of uh, energy. But we still uh, managed to, um, uh, to be very loud in the terms of, uh, of, of uh, let's say, media presence. And uh, <clears throat> actually, the, the event uh, uh, which launched this group, uh, which happened in 2012, in December, 
uh, was that um, actually the very first uh, uh, public meeting of the Hungarian Academy of Arts uh, was um, disturbed and um, by, by a kind of... Uh, uh, protests we organized uh, within this uh, uh, very uh, fancy <coughs> uh, gathering, and actually that's how it started. And later on, we <coughs> uh, we produced uh, like uh, 11 uh, more protests. Our activity kind of started as a group. It it stopped in 2015. Uh, later on, I might come back on on uh, on the reasons why it stopped. And for sure, there were also other uh, um, uh, attempts to uh, to go against the uh, this whole process. One of it was uh, initiated by this Transit Action Days, uh, which was uh, to some extent animated by the Transit Office uh, Budapest, belonging to the Erste Foundation, uh, who together with the free artists, with our group, uh, protest group, uh, we established the Alliance for Contemporary Art, and among other uh, actions, we we organized the, the 12 days occupation of the Ludwig Museum uh, in Budapest, uh, <clears throat> which was, um, I think, one of the, one of the best uh, actions we ever had, in spite of the fact that we didn't really reach any particular uh, achievement uh, through that uh, occupation. And um, uh, probably some of you knows about what is going on in, in the public spaces of Budapest. Right now we don't really have the time to go uh, in the details and to, to introduce you to more uh, examples, but uh, one of the examples is this um, uh, monument, the monument of the victims of the German occupation, which is in the, one of the most uh, uh, kind of important, symbolically most uh, loaded uh, <coughs> spaces of, uh, of, uh, of Budapest. And this is a very controversial monument. Actually, uh, what it does, it denies the historical responsibility of, of, of Hungary during the Second World War. And for sure, it, it overrides, or uh, the intention is to override the uh, uh, collective memory of uh, the Hungarian history. And uh, <clears throat> so I kind of uh, made reference to this monument because uh, one of the, let's say, most successful uh, kind of uh, uh, group work I, uh, I was uh, uh, initiator of and, and member for quite long is the Living Memorial, which is a kind of protest group uh, that uh, uh, came together as a kind of protest against this particular monument and uh, well with the main uh, uh, kind of concept of uh, uh, of creating instead of a fake uh, uh, and uh, <clears throat> uh, yeah kind of um, very uh, detestable kind of public monument in in, in uh, stone and and bronze instead to to organize uh, kind of a living uh, a living memorial which consists of of, of speeches and uh, Continuous meetings uh, with people, and it's a, it's one of the success, one of the most successful uh, initiative because it is still uh, this this is the only one which still uh, which is still on. And uh, let me just uh, try to make a balance here of a very short one, uh, actually, of uh, what do I believe that we achieved with uh, this rather four years of, of, uh, of quite intense uh, kind of uh, protest work. And uh, what we failed in, actually, you can, uh, you can read them on the screens. And I, I spent a lot of time by, by thinking what might have been the possible reasons for these uh, uh, failures, especially. And uh, I think uh, the, the, the number kind of two uh, uh, argument here, like the low level of the civil political activity, uh, the non-existent syndicalist traditions, is, it is one of the most important uh, reasons why practically any of, of, of these uh, protest uh, kind of activities couldn't reach the, let's say, the critical mass that would have been able later on to induce any changes. So uh, our group of maybe 20 people uh, and some other maybe 50, 60 people around us, um, we just failed in, uh, in inducing any change. And uh, uh, I would just sh very short introduce you two of my, uh, uh, um, my project. One of them, uh, the one you can see on the slide now, it is connected to this uh, particular monument. 
and uh, uh, actually um, in this uh, <clears throat> in this whole scandal around the monument i just decided to uh, to create a temporary audio monument which consisted of a request towards uh, all the hungarian radio stations in which i was asking them to air this particular uh, song the hatikva and uh, then you can read on the bottom that only two stations um, uh, joined the project uh, and then <clears throat> later on i created a uh, 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 kind of installation out of that. And another project on which I spent a lot of time since I, let's say, stopped uh, doing activist work is uh, this project. You can uh, have the book uh, circulating right now among you. And it is called From Fake Mountains to Fate. And actually, uh, it is a research-based, um, kind of uh, quite complex project. Uh, it is a trilogy which consists of two long videos and um, 140 different objects uh, organized as a museum. And uh, within this work, actually, I tried to, uh, to somehow analyze the, uh, the anatomy of, of this new let's say, uh, <clears throat> um, uh, illiberal ideology with all its kind of historical and uh, <clears throat> uh, revisionist uh, background, which I think it is very important in, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in the Hungarian case. It consists of two longer videos. So these, the, the two la uh, latest slides were about uh, some short uh, <clears throat> uh, excerpts like or, or uh, stills from the video. And it consists of a kind of, of uh, fake um, uh, museum, which describes actually the, the, the history uh, of how this particular uh, uh, ideology has been uh, uh, developed in my view. And uh, probably uh, when, uh, many times, this is my last remark, uh, uh, and many times when I'm kind of speaking about this piece, the, the piece uh, proved to be very successful. It's been shown in in uh, seven countries. Right now it is in, in show in, in Germany. And I, I took part in many public uh, uh, kind of talks related to this uh, uh, project. And I always uh, have to add to it that uh, the success of this project, uh, partly it is uh, due to uh, Prime Minister Orban. Uh, because I think the, 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 the overall interest uh, towards uh, uh, this piece uh, has been pretty much fueled by his uh, uh, fame uh, or uh, yeah, kind of um, uh, he, 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 his career, actually, which he, he managed to do with his, um, with his ideology, which is about to spread uh, all around the world. And I think I would leave it like this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sabolc. So our next, we'll take questions at the end. So jot down any questions you've got, and then we can go through the panel to answer them. Our next speaker is Katalin Seke, who is Creative Program Officer at the Blinken Open Society Archives, where she curates and manages a critically engaged program of exhibitions and public events. Since 2014, she's also a member of the curatorial team of the Off Biennale Budapest, which is the largest independent grassroots arts initiative in Hungary. With an educational background in art history and German literature, she was a curator between 2008 and 13 at the Ludwig Museum of Contemporary Art, with specialist interest in Central European art of the 1960s to the present day, namely institutional critique and new media practices. Currently, she's a PhD candidate in the Film, Media and Contemporary Culture doctoral program of the Utrecht Lorand University in Budapest. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> Thank you for the and, um, um, we discussed quite a lot how to, um, how to start, who, which one of us should start, and um, I was really happy that it was, uh, was Sabolc uh, who was the first, because um, where he drops, basically, uh, the part of activism, um, that's where our story starts. Uh, or that's not only uh, the place where our story starts. What I would like to talk about is an older story, which is still very mu much present in uh, the Hungarian society. And uh, even though it seems to be a very post-socialist story, what I'm, going, uh, what I'm about to tell you, uh, I think what... Um, Sabolc told you is true, it's, Hungary is really a model and you should listen to what's happening there. 
uh, also in terms of the past, what happened there uh, previously. And just an anecdote that came to uh, my mind in 2012, Boris Groys came to Budapest and he visited an exhibition at the National Gallery, which was already part of the um, newly founded a liberal system where uh, there was a huge exhibition on uh, historical paintings ordered by the state. And he was very happy uh, to see those paintings and he told us that it was really like, so this is really the avant-garde of the retrograde. So that's something that you should really pay attention to. Uh, so, uh, but my story starts basically, or my uh, presentation, uh, start uh, two uh, years ago in Wien, um, because uh, what I'm ab about to tell you is about censorship and how is it implied uh, via funding. And um, this is a, a very rare example when um, a leader of the institution, uh, the director of the uh, Collegium Hungaricum in Vienna, ordered a work um, to be taken down right before the opening. This work, um, which was made by uh, the artist Wu, uh, working under the pseudonym uh, Lurinz Borsos, uh, was a play uh, with the Hungarian flag. And the director said that political works cannot be shown in a cultural center of the Hungarian state. And um, she found this work at the formation of the hung Hungarian flag, uh, which she considered rather tasteless. As mentioned, cases like this are rather rare in Hungary. Uh, censorship happens um, more in a more informal and invisible way. Um, the, most of the time, the programs of uh, cultural institutions is uh, composed carefully enough that nothing really critical comes through or gets to the wider audiences. Uh, and if that happens, there is always a phone call coming or an invitation to a private chit chat when things can, uh, can get straight. Um, but they really don't want to have a scandal or they try to avoid scandal and the ensuing heroism. Uh, so, um, we, we really have to uh, consider our institutions as something uh, that are uh, connected and very much linked to uh, the state ideology. There are less subtle interventions. Um, there is a huge series uh, at uh, one of the uh, weeklies, uh, hand-controlled media outlet uh, of the government, Magyar Iduk, um, which is now under a different label, but still the same ideology governs those uh, opinion articles, uh, which is about uh, the cultural dictatorship of the former uh, cultural elite. And uh, several leaders, uh, even conservative leaders, uh, have been attacked um, during the last few years for promoting so-called communist propaganda or for promoting gay propaganda that was, for instance, um, by presenting the musical Billy Elliot. Uh, and um, the leaders of these institutions uh, have been since then replaced. There is no direct connections between these uh, articles and the actual removal of these uh, institution leaders, but still there are uh, very harsh uh, voices in the um, media controlled by the state that uh, culture should be univocal, it should be really conservative. Um, this um, problem is that um, how these institutions really try to avoid controversies is very much known uh, in Hungary. Uh, Institutional autonomy um, didn't really was discussed uh, neither during nor after the fall of communism. And when uh, the Fidesz uh, came to power in uh, 2010, uh, there still was no significant alternative to state financing in the visual arts, which meant that they really had uh, all the opportunity to 
um, define everything in terms of um, finance, uh, financial incentives. <coughs> Jade and uh, Sabocha already told you about MMA, this famous Academy of Hungarian Arts. And uh, what I really uh, need to tell you how exactly these um, sensorial practices happen, which are, as mentioned, informal and not open uh, sensorial uh, directives. Um, so, repression in Hungary is done by soft but very effective measures, by marginalizing and chastising individuals and organi organizations, for instance, in the um, media, by keeping institutions under strict control, by calling the uh, leader of an institution that, no, no, you are not allowed to do that, and please keep critical content away from uh, your premises, and by redistributing public funds and tying grants to non-professional criteria, which happens through MMA. Uh, they also try to prevent any forms of alternative funding. They uh, practically um, sent away um, one of the biggest um, grants for civic organizations, the uh, Norway grants, um, because uh, which had to cease their activities uh, due, due to the fact that they did not want to um, give the control over the funds for civic organizations to the Hungarian government, so they did not want to um, uh, align with the politics of the Hungarian government and they seize their activities. Other funding bodies have left the country already, so it's, um, uh, they really want to uh, avoid any other money uh, to get into the alternative system. So one can't help but notice the striking similarity of this situation to those of the state socialist times. Uh, but I, I, I'm going to read now a uh, quotation. Uh, the old censorship is increasingly being superseded by something altogether new, less visible and more dangerous. The techniques of the new censorship are fundamentally different from those employed by classical censorship. The heavy-handed methods of the past are pressed into service only when the new ones fail to function properly. That this occurs relatively rarely in Hungary testifies not to the state liberalization, but to the growing success of more subtle means of constraint. Traditional censorship presupposes the inherent opposition of creators and censors. The new censorship strives to eliminate this antagonism. The artist and the censor, the two faces of official culture, diligently and cheerfully cultivate the gardens of art together. This new culture is the result, not of raging censorship, but of its steady disappearance. Censorship professes itself to be freedom because it acts like morality as the common spirit of both the rulers and the ruled. Uh, these sentences were written almost 40 years ago, in 1980 in Budapest, and it was um, published as a um, uh, dissident literature, or dissident publication, as a sum is that, in 1986, uh, the author, Miklos Harasti, was himself a dissident uh, thinker, intellectual poet who had several times, uh, who several times under surveillance himself, uh, was arrested and in trial. Uh, the book, which uh, the English title is The Velvet Prison Artists Under State Socialism, uh, describes this collaboration uh, between different stakeholders of um, the art system, of the art world, who collectively agree uh, on a very inform in, in a very informal way uh, about what is uh, possible uh, to be presented and what is not. Um, if we would like to understand what's happening in Hungary today, we really need to understand what was happening back then, because the same patterns, the same gestures reoccur every now and then. Uh, in, uh, the, the most important figure of uh, uh, state socialist culture in Hungary, Atzel György, 
uh, famously declared that there was no censorship in Hungary, um, and he summarizes basically what is happening today. Those in charge of, of the organs of the press, the other mass media and the forums of public opinion must decide for themselves and take the responsibility for the views they bring before the public. We regard it as a fundamental task to, to express different views so long as it is not a question of concepts hostile to the system. And that's basically the most important part of this sentence or, or this statement, that uh, you are not allowed to be hostile um, to the system and you have to make this decision yourself. Um, and um, indeed there was no censorship bureau uh, in Hungary during state socialist times, at least during Atia's, um reign of uh, the cultural life, so from the uh, 60s on. Uh, but there were certain institutions, these were professional bodies, uh, and uh, they were empowered to permit or pro prohibit art events and performances. Um, and they could easily rely on the artists themselves that they would apply these unwritten set of criteria to their own works. Uh, but the problem is that in a society like this, everything can be dangerous. Um, there's another uh, quotation from this period um, by philosophers um, Fahir Ferenc, uh, Agnes Heller and uh, Jörg Markus. In a political society, even more so in a totalitarian society, everything is politics, both for those who govern and who are being governed. That is why the dif differentiation between political and non-political culture is out of question. Every cultural product expresses either apology or opposition. And that is also, to do, uh, is also true in Hungary today. Uh, we really cannot uh, step out from the system of uh, antagonisms. And um, I also should mention the fact that uh, we are also facing the fear that uh, more heavy-handed censorship is uh, on the rise in Hungary too. For instance, I work at this uh, institution, the uh, Open Society Archives, which is part of the CU, the Central European University, uh, which you might have heard of because it was um, basically forced out uh, from the country during the last two years. There was a huge international campaign to keep this international uh, academic institution in Hungary um, from the side of um, international academics and from the side of the EU, um, but they failed. So, uh, indeed, there is a sense of uh, failure uh, when it comes to protests. And uh, it was a mass demonstration, so it was not only, I don't know, 20 people who demonstrated against uh, this so-called Lex CU, but many, many thousands, ten thousands of people, and um, the government didn't really give a damn about what, uh, what the people are saying on the street. And the same thing happens now, at the very same moment, uh, to the Hungarian Academy, which is the Academy of Sciences, so it's uh, the very prestigious, hundred and hundred years old institution, uh, which uh, is now um, fighting for its very own um, institutions, uh, research centers, uh, which the government uh, is about to colonize, basically. And even though there are protests and there are very, very uh, clear uh, statements from the side of the EU, uh, it's most likely going to happen. So at OSA, uh, we have the Radio Free Europe archives. You know, that was the radio which presented uh, international broadcasts to those living uh, on the other side of the Iron Curtain. Uh, it was recently announced that they are going to uh, renew its uh, broadcasting because the media is basically taken over uh, with very few examples by the government. Uh, OSA not only focuses on uh, the Cold War period, but also on human rights issues. So we have also a large correct collections um, on different human rights uh, violations. As mentioned, we also have a huge uh, archive of dissident uh, publications, a huge Samizdat collection. 
And uh, we also organize events and um, different exhibitions that address the question of how art and how culture can be co-opted by a reigning regime. So it, it's really only a question of time um, to, to wait for uh, more uh, serious attacks from the side of the government. Um, CU, which OSA is a part of, um, will relocate to Vienna. Uh, OSA, we hope, can remain in Budapest, but let's see what's going to happen. Um, but a little bit going back to this slide, uh, here you can see the different categories of the Kada regime. Uh, these were the cultural uh, categories, um, supported, tolerated, and prohibited. And um, these categories had very blurry uh, lines, so either an art product was uh, supported, exhibited, etc., or uh, it was um, put uh, sideways but uh, you did not really know how to decide and uh, in what category you were in, unless you really see, uh, you really saw um, the difference in the institutional framework of what you were doing. And that's what's really interesting for, uh, for that period and also for our period. Uh, we can learn quite a lot uh, from that generation of um, artists who worked under state socialism, like from uh, Tomas Santubi, who did not only protested against all kinds of censorship, including self-censorship, uh, he did not only build uh, his whole oeuvre around the idea of being forbidden or being prohibited, but he went further, he took a step further, uh, and he actively participated, for instance, in the Samizdat movement, uh, and that's why he was basically forced out uh, from the country. Uh, but the so-called institutional framework of these artists was uh, somewhat peculiar. peculiar. Um, Bela Hopp, who was also a figure around this new avant-garde gen uh, generation, summarized it in a very um, well, meaningful way um, about underground. Uh, what is underground, an official art? It is an artistic movement that neither supports nor attacks the uh, establishment, but remains outside of it. Any attack on the establishment would acknowledge its existence. Uh, you can read it further, but I think that's the most important part. You need to play on your very own turf. You need to step aside from these stupid antagonisms, and you really need to build up a parallel um, way of living, a parallel way of functioning, a parallel way of reclaiming your rights to uh, continue your work. Uh, and that's something that of biennial aims. Um, it, it was basically built on, on, that, uh, on those energies that Sabot already mentioned, so we really went to all these uh, protests, not all, but Quite, quite a few, uh, and uh, we really felt that uh, lethargy and disappointment that we did not succeed uh, many of our goals. Uh, so we decided to be more, uh, to be more proactive, and uh, and not always uh, talk about uh, the system itself, um, but to talk about our very own issues, uh, which is obviously connected. Uh, to uh, what's happening in Hungary, um, but we really want to do that in our ter uh, on our own turf. Uh, so Off Biennial refuses any kind of uh, state money and uh, does not use um, the state-financed um, art infrastructure, uh, which was also the, the decisive moment uh, for the generation of uh, Mikros Harasti to everything was financed by the state. And if everything is financed by the state, they are going to be the ones who decide uh, what is allowed and what is not. So you need to step aside from it. You need to find new ways to finance yourself. 
Um, and this way, we wanted to strengthen, or we want uh, to strengthen the local independent art scene, to take part in the social discourse on public issues, and to enhance the culture of democracy, to present art that is neither decoration nor does it align with official ideologies and state propaganda. For instance, we also presented Sabol Sabolch's um, work and Katarina's project. And uh, we want to claim competence in our own issues, to assume responsibility, to develop and practice models of collaboration that present democratic values that the current system is lacking. Um, the first edition was something like an umbrella project. It did not really have a thematic frame. We had supporters, which is, as mentioned, it is really important to talk about different funding bodies and uh, your relationship to it. And it's not only about state money, but you really have to consider also the capital in which you will be or you want to be involved with. Um, so it's really new ways of uh, getting uh, a production like of Biennial done. Uh, it is largely, uh, in, in the first edition, was largely based on voluntary work um, and we used very diverse um, places to present projects like the Hungarian Parliament or different um, smaller independent places. The uh, second edition was more focused, and uh, there we presented this project by um, Sabolcs and Katarina. And uh, it had less projects, and it, was, it had a thematic focus, uh, which uh, recalled the story of a post-war children's democratic society, and many, many projects were around this um, topic, how to learn uh, society, uh, how to learn democracy and how to create a joyful society by raising your voices. And um, we, we organized it with uh, the um, uh, help of the Kulturstiftung des Bundes, because it was also a collaboration with the uh, GFZK in Leipzig. Uh, where the exhibition or part of the exhibitions were also presented. And uh, in the next edition, which will happen next year, uh, we will continue this road. We are going to step out from this velvet prison. We will focus on, uh, so we'll have a more focused, a more condensed program. Uh, OFF is going to produce uh, all of these projects. That's going to be a new. Uh, a change in the structure uh, and that's something that's also important that we uh, really want to discuss uh, together with the participants uh, and make common decisions about uh, questions like how to be political and uh, also the thematic focus title and uh, everything else will be done together with the participants. So that's it. We come to our third contributor, Katerina Savic. She is a Berlin-based visual artist and founder of several artist-run initiatives, which include temporary spaces, publications, and a greengrocer. Her practice is characterized by collaborations and often take place as public realm performances. She was born in Serbia, trained as an artist in Budapest, and she's currently working and living in Berlin. As I mentioned before, she's not with us today, so, um, her longtime collaborator, Jofi, will be reading out some of her thoughts. I'm going to run her slide, in which we're going to begin with a statement from Katarina that she sent for us today. In 2017, we were commissioned by Off Biennale Budapest to develop a project. The Curfew, project by Gagi Laszlo and me, and in collaboration with many others, developed in conversation with curator Hainal Kashomoji, who approached us with the question whether we could imagine and together with them make a kind of a demonstration procession, something that would feel liberating, celebratory, and in which laughter and joy would have a central role. A rally that can enact freedom in the times when anti-democratic tendencies are on the rise. We were enthusiastic to think about this proposal, but first we wanted to question ourselves, what do demonstrations mean to us? What does the street mean to us? 
protests usually don't manage to achieve their goals. This tool for free speech and expression of free will seems not to function anymore. At the same time, at least they serve as emotional filters and are a way to keep sanity under political pressure. Demonstrations don't lead to real transformation, and this is what we really need. Further on, how to invite the public to a demonstration? Who will know about it in a country where the media is mainly state-run and is reporting only about events fitting official political and cultural canon? We also didn't want to use the bubble of social media. Then, can we propose an alternative to demonstration? We were thinking about what are the tools that are still functioning. If we are relying on exhibition spaces to express what we think, we are reaching just those who think similarly like us. We wanted to see how can we talk when we leave this safe zone of art institutions and galleries. In general, we wanted to point out the need of leaving our own comfort zones in order to make whatever change. If we want to go to the street, what are the tools that are not elite and easily available to anyone to use? Because what we wanted to propose was a model that is not directed, but rather something that can be applied and developed collectively, anytime and anywhere. A form that doesn't need infrastructure, that is not expensive and that is not centralized. A form that can gather and disassemble easily. A form that can live on its own. We realize those are the forms, or rather tools, archaic tools of storytelling and choir. We came with the idea to make a street performance about the transformation we need in the society, which is equal to a miracle. This is why our motto during the work on this project became, don't save your skin, get it off your back. Get under the skin, take somebody's skin, expose, jump out of our skin. Okay, so um, I'm here today because Katarina couldn't make it, but um, fortunately, I'm the one who took part in many of her projects, uh, working alone or together with um, Laszlo Gerge. So I have an insider's view of the whole curfew project, but first of all, I will read something that Katarina would have said if she were here. So. I'm just going to read about the structure of the performance so you can understand what actually happened on the off Biennale that uh, Kati was talking about. So, um, the street play of the curfew is an alternative form of public demonstration. With this performance, we decided to go to the street. To go to the street, we needed to use the tools that are easily available to anyone and not just elite. The curfew is a proposal for a model that is not directed but rather something that can be applied and developed collectively anytime, anywhere, and has a potential for development and a potential to endure time. The story in short. A true probes the streets of Budapest. They push in front of them a three-meter-high, egg-shaped, multi-layer megaphone. They make great noise. They stop at busy public squares to perform their play as a speaking choir about the transfiguration of a group of security guards. The members of the group vow to give back the voice to the people from whom they, whom they previously took it away. Motto, don't save your skin, get it off your back. Get out of your skin, get under the skin, be naked, sell your skin. During the play performed on the streets, the speaking choir recounts the origins of the transfiguration of a group of security guards, how they miraculously come to realize that all along they had only been blindly the thugs of the powers that be. They had intimidated and silenced their peers in the name of the mighty. In the wake of their revelation, the guards turn their back to their destiny and decide to give back the people's voices. They are helped by the magical talking egg in which the voices reborn and amplify. They vow to protect the egg and bring it onto the streets to the people to spread the gospel. In order to tell the story, we relied on the tools developed and used in Commedia dell'arte and in general of street theater. The building structure of the performance, mainly the choir part, is a fugue, which is a multi-layered genre, a construction of pluralistic voices. The building blocks of the curfew are 
when security guards find the egg, they start using to perform the choir piece of the performance. Part number one, the walk. We planned the procession beforehand, made a route from square to square. We performed the curfew on two occasions, each time for about five hours. During one occasion, the same play was performed five times with procession in between. Second, action. The performers move in a group, they are aggressive, they look for those ones they want to silence. They themselves don't speak, but use uh, gramlo, sounds with meaning, without meaning. Use gramlo, sounds without meaning. When they find someone who makes noise, performers wearing leather masks, they beat them and eat them. This part experiments with a simple agitation tool. The performers perform an action that is easy to understand. They use comedy, gramlo technique, they're grotesque. We prepared for it with the help of Valesh Varnai and Christian Shimo, experts in street theater. In one moment, the magic awakens them to consciousness, to find a giant egg. Suddenly, they will come, become reflexive, sentient, critical. They will find their new voice and decide to, instead of making fear in the public space, help others express their voices. Number three, the choir. During the action, the security guards use gramolot instead of real words. In the choir part, recite the, next, the text written by poet Christian Per, which was commissioned for the purpose. The text was composed as a choir piece by Dora Halas, um, who is a leader in the Shoharosa choir. The choir is recited from the fugue with, with multiply overlapping voices, forming a palimpsest. Although using real words, this part is hardly to, hard to completely understand and follow. Summarizing, the whole performance is about finding the voice, polishing the voice, articulating. But the curfew presents the impossibility to understand the voice or to have one dominant voice. The choir part is poetic and complicated to follow. Words and pieces of the sentence reappear. From simple words to complicated palimpsest. So this is the explanation of um, what has happened. And um, since I took part, I gathered my thoughts two days ago when I learned that I will be jumping in for Katerina. So um, uh, I'm going to tell you about my experiences. I have known Katerina Shevich and Gergely Laszlo for a long period of time. Katerina and I have finished in the same year at the Hungarian University of Art fine arts in the intermediate department. Since I've been following Katarina Zengerga's series of actions, exhibitions, uh, the two of them acting as co-artists or exhibiting individually. In many of their projects, they have involved a number of people, fellow artists and friends as performers in their artwork. I had the privilege to take part in a number of these occasions. I therefore will talk about my insider's view of the curfew project. In the fall of 2007, as the Off Biennale, a celebration of free art in Budapest was approaching, and I was asked to participate in another project created by my friends, Katerina and Gergely. As always, I was very excited to be a part of a happening, taking, in part, taking part in the streets of Budapest. As we were told, the preparing would start with a workshop. About 15 people gathered in an empty apartment in downtown Budapest, musicians, choir members, contact movement experts, experimental theater leaders, poets, and friends of artists. Mm. Just a minute. Soon we decided on our roles. We would choose between acting in unity as safety guards with uniforms or on being individual with a mask on our face assimilating in the crowds of the street. I chose to be a guard. And one of, the goals of the workshop, one of the goals of the workshop was to experience our strength as a group of people moving together, marching together as soldiers, but always alert for silent orders coming from within the strongest one amongst us. At the same time, taking advice and suggestions for explicit moves or gestures from the artists Katarina and Gergely. The other assignment was to identify with the one acting alone, being the prey, to feel the loneliness of the revolutionary enthusiasm or just the necessity of the inner thoughts to exist. Being the one 
in love singing on the street, the crazy one yelling on a corner, or the mother reaching out for help, all of them loud and standing out in their own ways. In the process of rehearsing, we also had a role to sing together as a choir, although most of us had no experience in this form of expression. We were modeling the street as a space of our show to be, but all the time we knew that we were in a safe surrounding. The apartment was quiet and empty. We didn't have to watch where we stepped or take care of our belongings. Inside, everything went according to plan. During the weeks of rehearsing, we heard about the egg. The artists talked about it with such an excitement in their voices that we couldn't wait to see. The egg was our lucky Kabbalah, an object that will be pushed on wheels by all of us. As it is too big, it cannot be moved by one. It would be used to amplify our voices and to signify that something never seen before was happening in the streets of Budapest, to draw attention to ourselves appearing suddenly. We planned everything, trying to prepare for the unexpected, the flow of the city streets. The egg was vulnerable. It had to be handled with care. Moving it needed our full attention and coordination, otherwise it would drop. Dropping an egg. We couldn't let it happen. Finally, as the day of our show approached, we grew more and more excited to expose ourselves on the streets. The costumes came with the masks and the uniforms. It was time to go. As one of the performers, I experienced something strange. While marching in our uniforms, chanting a military-style poem out loud, rolling our egg on its wheels, slowly reaching the first station of our performance, we passed by a small cafe and meeting place where some of us performers were regular guests. Most of us have heard the circulating rumor about the place closing down soon, as do many other of these tiny centers of free thinking, open-minded spots in Budapest in the last few years. Although the artists' orders were clean that we must stick together as a group of guards whose power is their unity, some of us could not stop ourselves from separating from the performers to support our unfortunate friends, the owners of the soon-vanishing place. I hesitated for a moment, but decided to march on. Within a matter of seconds, as the others caught up, we re reunited and resembled a military march once again. We went on, but my dilemma stayed. Should I have broken free and listened to my heart, or was it better taking the orders and marching on with my unit? I had forgotten about the incident, as the performance continued, one cannot always stay on track since there is nothing that will go according to plan on the streets of a city. As we went on with our egg, stopping at squares and, st and st uh, starting our act with our peripheral senses, we acknowledged the world outside. We had been yelled at, we had been laughed at, we had to be much louder than we thought beforehand. We were selfied with, we were questioned, we, were stir we stirred the usual city atmosphere with our egg and our actions on the streets of Budapest. We looked in the eyes of unknown people reading the law of curfew and looked at each other holding on to our egg while singing the piece of fugue. We had to repair our egg structure from time to time because it couldn't take the rough surface of the cobblestone sidewalks and streets of Budapest. All of this was only possible by working together as a team. The series of our performances went on four or five times and I enjoyed every moment of it. Later, as a regular at the political demonstrations in Budapest, I had another kind of experience. I go to these events not only to express my opinion, but feel the crowd of people surrounding me who think similarly to me. It's a kind of necessity for my mental health. We yell short slogans and strong words expressing the frustration. On one of these gatherings, I found myself in front of the parliament building with a wall of police facing the demonstrators. They were tense but patient, looked self-secure in their uniforms and shields. They wouldn't react to what we had to say because they were not allowed to. Their orders came from above and their power from unity. They had uniforms. A friend of mine, a woman my age, tried convincing them one by one to swap sides. In the eyes of some, I could see the will to break free and join us, the ones who were free. I knew how it felt. A dilemma forever.
Can I ask the succession how many minutes we have for discussion, roughly? And I, and I would suggest that we, we would begin, as we're having drinks afterwards informally, you're welcome to join and ask any informal questions. If there's anything pressing from the audience that you would like to know as members of the local arts community, or things that tips or lessons that you'd like to ask from the panel. Is there anyone with a question? How many minutes? today and doing and getting an, a stronger impact on any political movement uh, such as in Hungary but uh, as well here uh, in this government or in neighboring countries uh, <clears throat> I think uh, there are actually there, there would be probably two aspects which I would reconsider if I would start it from the beginning, in, in, uh, in Hungary there is a tradition of, uh, <clears throat> of non-violent um, kind of uh, opposition <clears throat> because many, many of the um, kind of uh, <clears throat> groups that were organizing uh, different protests, they, they actually believe that uh, based on this Gandhian kind of uh, peaceful opposition <clears throat> which uh, proved to be so successful in India, that uh, that might be successful also in uh, in other parts of the world. So I would definitely reconsider that if I start from the beginning. Um, otherwise, um, probably could be reconsidered a more kind of um, kind of strategic and less um, less open activity. Yeah, well, me. Um it's really a huge question. So uh, the problem is that people basically are really happy to vote to the Fidesz. So if you are thinking in terms of democracy, uh, the people have voted them. It's, it's uh, a question how much it was, uh, the, the results of the elections were manipulated, but the truth is that there are many, many people behind them. So I think uh, you must really have long-term strategies. Uh, long-term strategies regarding to get to uh, the people to, to work with the remaining media, uh, independent media companies to talk about um, problems, to, to, to continue your protests even, even though it's unsuccessful. I think it's... it's it's the only thing you can do. And uh, hopefully you, you will get to more and more people. I'm sorry, it's not very helpful and, and very depressing, but that's, that's the situation. Hi, my question would be a little bit the other way around, what the gentleman asked. And it would be, some of you mentioned that actually what the government did was not completely uh, successful, or for example, the MMA did not manage to produce art. And as you showed us, actually, this oppression also produced some art on your side. So my main question would be how successful is all in all what the government is doing, and probably even more that how far would they go or how far do they want to go? What do you think? That's one question, and I would have another one later on if it's possible. <coughs> uh, just, uh, excuse me, could you just repeat the last part of it? Um, I might not get that it. How far would the government go, or what is your feeling, or how far do they want to go? What's the ultimate goal, or how far do they think? What do you think, how far the line is with, this, with these methods? Because as you said, it's still on the edge of like they are pressing, but it's not that open, you still mm -hmm. can do things, or mm -hmm. what do you feel, does it have an end? Does it have a goal, or is it just mm -hmm. an ongoing rolling wave? 
Uh, yeah, I think um, the, the intention is definitely to, uh, <clears throat> like from the side of the government, is to establish that kind of uh, society they are dreaming of, uh, which is very difficult to describe. There are many debates about this thing, what exactly this particular kind of political uh, yeah, uh, ideology is. <clears throat> and uh, I think uh, it won't go ever that far as, let's say, in Turkey. So uh, the repression won't be that harsh ever supposedly because of the, yeah, mostly because of the uh, agreement, uh, common agreement uh, with, uh, which comes with the membership of being a, <clears throat> a member of the uh, European Un Union. But I think, um, yeah, so they would go quite far. If I got right your question, like if, so the, the, the acoustics is very wrong, so I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if I got it right, but maybe if you can answer it better if, if you... I, 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 I'm sorry, I, uh, I think I heard you, and uh, the first question was about how successful it was, and uh, Sabos mentioned that they were not successful, but they were not successful in terms of artistic production. Uh, so they, they got the money, they got all the power, they got everything, so they won. They basically won, but they could not produce this MMA, this Hungarian Academy of Arts, could not produce any soul uh, hidden, forgotten, and uh, silenced figure from the past, from their past, because there is no uh, such a figure, and uh, they could not produce, even though they, they set up institutions and research centers, any pub major publications, any uh, really good uh, exhibitions, etc., because the the intellectual power is not with them, so you cannot buy it, you cannot get it via power. And in this sense, they were unsuccessful. But any other way, they 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 got all they wanted, and they want even uh, every every day more. So every day you open a newspaper or your internet, you see a, a news that uh, about something that you couldn't couldn't have possibly imagined in your wildest dreams. For instance, the, this attack against the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, it's something in, in, in imaginable and, and it's still happening. And I, I also agree with Sabolc that they are going to continue. I, I have a feeling that the, the, tolerance, the tolerance of people um, just changed. Um, People, you have to understand that the, the, the people of Hungary have been used to a patriarchal system since always, so there was always someone telling them what to do and what to believe and, and what they cannot do, and there were, there were times when they could oppose, but usually the decisions came from above, and people just ha have got used to that so much, in my view, that they're happy to have a father figure in in, in, the, in the person of Viktor Orban at the moment, many of them. So what we're talking about art at the moment is um, really, really important for those people who would like to think freely and, and it, um, it is some kind of a, a chance to, to show ourselves in a way that, we, that, that like majority of people couldn't in any other way. It's very, it's very hard to have your voice heard if you're in the opposition. So um, I, I have a feeling that, that uh, for example, this of Biennale is one of the most important things that happened lately, because we, we feel that something is changing in the way that we are one step forward and not um, waiting for, for the orders, basically. So, yeah. I think we have time for one more question. One, two. Thank you very much for being here today and uh, sharing your experience. It's uh, very interesting, uh, I think. Um, I was wondering, um, as your neighbors, uh, how could we support you? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's um, probably 
probably the visibility, enhancing the visibility of, of, um, uh, of different, uh, yeah, kind of uh, small uh, initiatives that are taking place on the, on the field of, of culture. On one hand, on the other hand, uh, yeah, I think the, the, the biggest help would be if you stay firm in your country with your political system. <laughs> Because uh, ev everything is shaking, and it's, yeah, it will become even worse if uh, you know the balance goes in that way. So uh, <clears throat> I think these two um, maybe elements would be of a big help. I think the other thing is that, um, as uh, Jofi already mentioned, we did not really learn how to help ourselves. So it's high time to, to change that and high time to think about ourselves as our own saviors and not to wait for someone from outside. But uh, I agree with Sabo, so stay, stay firm for us. I would say solidarity, as in organizing events like today to provide a platform and potentially if there is a means for partnership, collaboration, develop projects, longer term projects, obviously funding that could go into Hungary, but also outside. Mm -hmm. So uh, ac activities like now and exhibitions, publications. Mm -hmm. Jofi? Mm, I don't know. Um, going, m m many of you come to Hungary to see the Biennale and cheering for it and show interest in what Hungarian artists are up to because um, there is a big resignation in our nation. So. Um, it's always really a great feeling to have people being interested. So I think we have one last question from the audience. Uh, just a very short one. Uh, is it any help that uh, Hungary is in the European Union? Do you think that there could happen a positive backlash or do you think more that the European Union is now going towards all towards right wing. <laughs> if, it, if it has a positive backlash? Uh, yeah, a positive impact for the Hungarian people to be in the European Union. Mm -hmm. Or if, 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 if the people find maybe different role models, if the whole politics are changing maybe in the European Union, if the European Union, if that could help somehow. Yeah, I mean, it's for sure. I mean, it's definitely, uh, <clears throat> it's a protection actually being an, uh, in the uh, European Union. Uh, it's just uh, the reference I, I made a few minutes uh, before, like, uh, <clears throat> so in Hungary at this very moment, at least to my knowledge, there is no, uh, there are no political prisoners. And uh, the whole um, kind of manipulation of the culture uh, and also of the economy, including the, <clears throat> like, yeah, basically all the fields, it is um, unfolding in a, let's say, um, very manipulative, uh, but still kind of, let's say, peaceful. I don't know to, to what extent it can be called peaceful, but it's not uh, that aggressive. Like people are not taking, taken, you know, to the jail during the night for nothing, yeah? <clears throat> which happens in, in, let's say, in Turkey in tens of thousands. And uh, I'm absolutely sure that if Hungary would step out of the European Union, uh, things would change uh, in that direction. So from that point of view, it's definitely um, it's a protection. Uh, um, the laws, no? Some certain laws which are in, within the European Union that countries, nations cannot change them because we had that in Austria as well. For the Mindestsicherung, for instance, mm -hmm. that the government wanted to ch change it, but now yeah, the, the, the European Uni Union told them it's not possible to do that. That's, you cannot just cut down the Mindestsicherung for foreigners. Answer this because I, th I understand your question yeah. from the Austrian side, but in Hungary the law already has changed. So the electoral system was changed, the media law has been changed, the whole parliament has been restructured. The so constitution the changed. constitution has changed. So in a way, the EU, you could argue, has failed Hungary because over the last nine years there hasn't been a political intervention. Well, th there has been, but uh, it's too slow. So the, yeah. the same thing happens in Poland. So it's really slow, and, and by the time this very slow procedure uh, and um, the system has already changed, so you cannot 
uh, turn it back. So that's why I was always, uh, uh, that's why I also mentioned that we, we, we are not allowed anymore to wait for outside help because it's, it's coming always late. And um, uh, our Prime Minister Smart, he finds the detours around the laws. So he presents something in the EU and then he would come to Hungary and say exactly the opposite to his nation to vote for him. It's, um, yeah, that's fact. <laughs> But anyhow, EU is very popular, even even among those who voted for Fidesz. So uh, yeah, yeah, and despite the fact that there were there are huge, uh, massive campaigns against Brussels, so uh, I think the uh, that's the highest percentage uh, in the European Union uh, in Hungary for people who who are are for for the EU. So it's pe people really like it, but. Uh, even though it doesn't really help us. I think this session has one more question, and then we will come to a close. Okay, so my question would be whether the 30 years of the commemoration of the change of regime, which actually the official year has just started yesterday in Hungary with that big concert, where the government also plans a lot of projects, including art projects and uh, programs like do you see any role for this year or any opportunity for yourself for example to counteract on it or to show up for example the roles of some today leading politicians in that context or um, or or to use or play on the symbolic gesture of that of that year that it's been 30 years that we Basically at OSA, so at these archives, we, we launched a project. Uh, it's an online project. Everything is online. All the documents, all the videos, all the photos. We organized different events around it. So just this Friday, we made um, almost 24-hour um, long um, screening of the reburial of Imran Naj and uh, the exhumation of, of the Prime Minister who was um, Prime Minister during the 56th revolution. So the, we, we really try to uh, compensate those damages that, that are done in our memory politics via <laughs> programs, via online activities, etc. But uh, as for the of biennial, it's much more difficult to react in such a, a short term since uh, biennial happen obviously every two years. So it's, uh, it's not that easy to uh, react in a more kind of journalistic manner. But I think individually, and uh, there are different organizations who, who try to interact with that kind of memory politics. Do you have any final comments from the panel? Then I would like Good to... Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So as a closing remark, I would just like to make a statement. So after nine years of battle, the reality is that beyond self-organisation and institutional critique, this resistance has required a total overhaul of private lives, professional practices and institutional structures. This goes for the panellists here and many civil society members who remain anonymous to this day. It is no longer a desire to reinstate previous systems, but a mission for an entirely new system where terms like public and private, imagined and real, past, present and futures can once again become hopeful. So on that more positive note, <laughs> I suggest we continue with the drink. To join us uh, downstairs in our bar, there's going to be drinks and we would like to continue our discussion with you in a more informal way.